Professor Grix here. So I hope everyone is staying safe from the hurricane and no one's out on the roads or hopefully in any place it's dangerous. Uh, as you know, we're missing class, but uh, we can't just take a free day. So that's what this presentation is for. Basically the same thing that you would get in a regular class, except I'm here in a studio that actually worked out really well. I'm sitting with some friends of mine and they run a YouTube uh, let's play channel called the oddlings. So thanks to them, go subscribe to their page. Um, yeah, I've got this really sweet setup with lights and a soundproof foam. I mean, this is pretty awesome, but, uh, you won't be looking at my face. Maybe that's a good thing. Uh, instead, let me head over to the PowerPoint presentation and off we go. Okay. So what this chapter is, is called Evaluating Art. It's a bit different from the other chapters because we're not really analyzing a composition. We're looking at different ways of deciding whether or not a work of art is, well, I guess any good, just different ways of looking at it. Uh, I've kind of stripped this chapter down a bit, just giving you the basics. Uh, but as you can see from this outline, uh, there are three basic methods for critiquing a work of art. Uh, we're going to address all three, and we are going to uh, address them to three different works of art, uh, these three. All right, so let's go ahead and get going. So the first method of evaluation uh, addressed here is formal theories. And uh, these questions, these aren't anything you have to memorize for testing sake. These are just questions to kind of get you started whenever you start to evaluate a work of art according to this method, which is really just the surface appearance whenever you just flat look at a work of art and not know anything about it. For instance, not reading the label. Uh, you would need to know what the style is to use this method of evaluation. How does the artist arrange the visual elements? Things like color, shape, line, form, focal point, things like that. You also just look at the overall style. And this is something we're going to address a lot whenever we get to uh, the chapters on artistic styles. Is this work cubism? Is it pre-Raphaelite? Is it realism? Is it impressionism? How does this work reflect that influence and how is it different from the norm? So in the case of this work of art, this is by uh, Titian, it's called the Pieta. And uh, one of the things that we would address according to this theory is the subject. And um, as you may already remember, we looked at a few Pietas, and that is any work of art that shows Mary holding the body of the crucified Christ. Pieta means lamentation. So this woman here, there it is, is Mary. This obviously is a crucified Christ. Over here, we have a woman with blonde hair, and uh, it, her hair is loose, hanging over her shoulders. And uh, just the fact that she is a woman present at the uh, crucifixion and at the deposition tells us who she is. Uh, that is Mary Magdalene. Uh, the figure here on the bottom right is a bit confounding. So uh, who would that be? What old man was present at the crucifixion? Um, this character kind of confuses art historians. It's kind of hard to tell precisely who he is. Here, let me zoom in on him. Uh, he uh, doesn't look like the usual old men at crucifixions, Nicodemus or Joseph of Arimathea. He is dressed in a way that really suggests St. Jerome, but St. Jerome wasn't alive then. So that character is kind of confusing, not quite sure who he's meant to represent according to these theories. Uh, the other figures, we have, of course, two small angels. Uh, over here on the right is a woman, Hellespontine, as it says here. Uh, she is a Sibyl uh, who foretells the New Testament. And over here on this side is Moses. You can see he holds the tablets. He represents the Old Testament. All right, now let's analyze the composition uh, very quickly. That's the color scheme. Uh, this work of art has a very low intensity color scheme. It's very brownish. All the colors are really dulled down. Uh, it is a large painting. Take a look at the caption. As you can see, it's 11 feet by 12 feet. It's actually one of the largest paintings Titian ever made. Here you can see it in scale. 
And as a matter of fact, it's so large, um, he had to sew two pieces of canvas together. You can see the seam here, and there's also a seam here. That is uh, the three pieces of canvas that had to be stitched together for this large composition. Uh, as for the style, it is late Renaissance. How is this similar to and different from other late Renaissance? Similar. It's a religious theme. This is a culture that really embraced Christianity. Uh, he follows a lot of the same iconographic traditions here. Uh, but one way in which it breaks from tradition is the arrangement of the figures. See how there's this really strong diagonal just sort of pushing off to the edge of the canvas? That's unusual. Renaissance artists usually like their works to be centered. And also unusual is uh, the way this is painted. It's a little hard to tell in this slide, but I think you can sort of make out that it's rather brushy. I would describe it as being very loose, very painterly, uh, which is a vocabulary word you'll, lose, you'll learn later. And uh, that sort of brushy, quick application of paint, that very rush, unfinished look is unusual. Renaissance artists typically like their work to look a little bit more polished. So that's how it differs from tradition. And again, that's the method of evaluation you would use according to the formal theories. And I'm really focusing on this one for this chapter, but uh, let me go ahead and see how it applies to the other two works of art. Uh, this is a very colorful, fun painting by Sonia Delaney Turk. It's called Simultaneous Contrasts. Um, as you can see, the color scheme for this work of art is much different. The colors are very high intensity. They are bright. They're brilliant. Um, it uh, really plays off of complementary color relationships. Things like blue and orange and the kind of reds and greens and the purples and the yellows place next to each other. And as you may remember from our discussions on color theory, whenever you place complementary colors next to each other, they pop, they intensify, they look really, really bright. As far as style goes, this is a work of art that is inspired by Cubism. And even not knowing that about the artist, you could tell that this is a very Cubist inspired piece because uh, it's full of geometric shapes. Uh, it's a recognizable subject broken down into flat geometric shapes. Can you guess what the scene is supposed to be? Well, it's a landscape. Uh, you can barely make it out, uh, but you can sort of see that there's a sun here, hills, and we get the basic idea that this is supposed to be a hilly, sunny landscape. But if you're sort of squinting at your screen thinking, really? That's okay, because uh, Cubist works are very, very highly abstracted, and this is no exception. Uh, something interesting I thought about the composition, whenever I was researching this piece, I found out that there's a bit of debate about which end is up for this piece, because uh, the artist signed it here, her signature sits along this edge. So if we flip the painting 90 degrees to the left, uh, some people wonder if maybe that's how the signature should sit, so that it's at the bottom of the frame, which is a typical way that artists would sign their pieces at the bottom. Uh, but most people seem to agree that it should go this way. But I thought it was kind of interesting. The piece kind of tends to change quite a bit whenever you flip it around. Okay, and now for this one. As you can see, I left the title off. Typically in class, whenever I show this, I like to sort of turn to the class and ask, uh, what can you see? What is the subject for this work of art? Um, and whenever you look, it is, again, highly abstracted, but you can see a man playing a saxophone. We've got musical notes. Uh, there's a trumpet player over here. And the work is by Jean-Michel Basquiat, and it's called Horn Players. As you can see down here at the bottom, it is three pieces of canvas. There are three separate paintings here. So how does the artist unify these paintings? Where do you see repetition and theme, colors? used throughout, black and blue. He uses words in all three. He uses boxes, he uses white shapes. Every single panel has a face. You may not care for this work of art too much, but it is intelligently composed. I couldn't flip these panels around in any other order. It's really meant to look the best here. If you look a little bit closer, you can make out some names here at the top of the panel. Dizzy Gillespie, and below it, a suggestion of the words Charlie Parker. 
And uh, you can also see one word that appears on all three panels is the word ornithology. And that is the study of birds. And that is a reference to the two characters. This is Dizzy Gillespie and that's Charlie Parker. They were jazz musicians. And Charlie Parker's nickname was The Bird. He and Dizzy collaborated on an album called The Yardbird Suites. One of the tracks was Ornithology. So that is meant to be the connection here. There's a lot of uh, sort of jazz references in this piece. Uh, so that's the subject, the composition, and again, just looking at the surface value. All right, but now on to context. This requires a bit more research. This is placing the work of art in its historical context. What was happening when this work was created? And does it reflect that cultural environment. Was this uh, work of art done right after 9-11? Was this work of art done during the Middle Ages? Was this work of art going on uh, during the French Revolution? How does this painting reflect that cultural environment? And that becomes really interesting whenever you look at Titian's. So you need to know when it was painted and where. And this was painted in Venice in 1576. And if you were to look up what was happening in Venice at this time, you would find out that this was painted during an outbreak of the plague. One third of the city of Venice died of the plague in 1576. That's what's happening whenever the artist was working on this. And knowing that, I think the painting takes on a special degree of interest. It's dark. It's sad. It's, it's about people mourning over the dead Christ. And I think that sort of makes sense because uh, this would be relatable. This work of art was meant to go in a church. That's its context as well. So people coming to church, perhaps to bury their loved ones, could look at this work of art showing Mary mourning over her loved one, and it just creates sort of a personal connection. Now, this is kind of neither here nor there, but here's an interesting bit of information for you guys. I started to research the, uh, the plague of 1576, and I found this article addressing the excavation of this island called uh, Lazaretto. Nuovo Island. Lazaretto uh, means quarantine. Uh, so this was a quarantine station during the plague and uh, there's a mass grave site here. And that's where they excavated this. It's a skull with a brick jammed in its mouth. And it was buried like that. Um, it wasn't, it didn't just fall in. This is a woman skeleton and she has a brick placed in her jaw. Why? It's because she's a vampire, or so they thought. Uh, this related to just a phenomenon that happens with dead bodies. Sometimes all of the, di the digestive juices, um, they sort of curdle in the stomach, you might say. And all of that liquid has to go somewhere, and sometimes it comes out the mouth. People would be buried in shrouds in open graves. They would just keep piling people on as they died. And sometimes they would look down into the mass grave see a woman or see anyone just wrapped up in a white shroud and see this bloody mess where their mouth is and all of the bacteria would uh, eat away at the shroud and also at the person's lips exposing their teeth making them appear longer so they thought that this is a vampire who was eating his or her way out of the shrouds. One of the uh, early terms for a vampire or the undead was a shroud eater. And they thought this could be how the plague was spread. How do you stop them? How do you stop vampires from eating their way out of their shrouds? Well, like this, jam a brick in its mouth, that'll do it. And I thought it was just kind of interesting to think that this is the kind of environment that Titian was living in, the superstitious, fearful environment with dead bodies and mass grave sites and uh, vampires stalking about spreading the plague. I don't know, I just thought that was really, really cool, very interesting. All right, but let's go ahead and move on. All right, so when was this painted and where? Paris, 1913. Does this work of art reflect Paris in 1913? 
I think I'd have to say not really. Uh, it's just a sunlit landscape. I don't really see any indication of what Paris life was like. I don't see any sort of World War I era concerns. Uh, so this is one of those uh, instances where sometimes a theory just doesn't fit. It just doesn't really reveal much about the work of art. Uh, so analyzing the composition or looking at the work of art in context, sometimes it's just not helpful. It doesn't really reveal all that much about the piece. One thing that does give us some historical information is the title. Simultaneous contrast refers to an essay, this paper written by an ophthalmologist about color theory and about complementary color specifically. So since this work of art is titled that, it tells me that the artist has read that article and is trying to put those ideas into practice. And then finally, this work of art was done in New York City in 1983. And I think it does tell us a little bit of what uh, New York City was like. This work of art does reflect its cultural and environment. It feels like an American city. There's this sort of graffiti influence. Uh, Jean-Michel Basquiat was a graffiti artist, very much involved in this sort of um, underbelly, you might say, of um, American society in New York City in the 1980s. So again, that's what makes this work of art interesting, how it fits into that sort of early 80s New York City environment. And then lastly, this is a theory that uh, does play up quite a bit. Expressive theories is the how does the artist express himself in this work of art? Back on the first day of class, whenever I asked, what are some of the reasons why people make art? One of the things that people usually say is to express themselves. So that means if you know who the artist was, what this person was like, it can reveal quite a bit about the work of art. If we assume that artists create a painting to express himself or to express herself, we would need to know some biographical information about the artist and what was happening when this piece was executed. So in this case, who was Titian? Well, Titian was a very famous artist of the Renaissance, very respected, very influential. And uh, he was an old man when he painted this. Actually, 1576 is the year that he died. This is one of the last two paintings he ever made. And that explains the brushy style that I mentioned earlier. A lot of times whenever artists get to be very old, their older compositions, they tend to be a bit more loose, a lot more brushy and abstract. Perhaps it's because the artist can't control the brush well. Um, maybe their eyesight is failing. Or maybe it's just because they know that it doesn't matter if people like it or if they're going to be able to uh, sell this. Uh, this is a instance of someone who's just sort of ending the end of his career and the end of his life. And whenever we take a look at who Titian was and how he's expressing himself here, something really, really interesting starts to come forward. The identity of the man at the bottom right. As I said, they're not quite sure who this character is supposed to be biblically, but whenever we consider the expressive theories and ask ourselves who Titian was, well, look at this self-portrait he did whenever he was an older man. This is a self-portrait. He painted himself in this work of art. And there's something really tragic about that. Look at the way he sort of leans forward and looks into Jesus's face. Look at the way he carefully touches Christ's hand. And look at the way that his foot trails off the edge of the canvas there. There's this sort of eerie idea that he crawled into the painting to do something, uh, to talk to Jesus, to try and plead with him, maybe plead for forgiveness or perhaps for another purpose. So take a look at the bottom right. I've got a close up here. It's a pretty lousy slide, but it's the best I could find. But uh, there's the Titian family seal. And this is a painting showing an old man with a beard and a young man with a ruffled collar praying before a vision of the Virgin Mary. And um, artists, art historians believe that that is meant to be a painting of Titian and his younger son, Orezio who died of the 1576 plague. And knowing that Titian, his son was 
dying or maybe even dead whenever he painted this. And Titian as an old man was grieving for his son and maybe even trying to pray that he would be healed. And I don't know, this work of art suddenly takes on a really tragic tone whenever you consider that. Now, as I said, 1576 is also the year that Titian died. Um, whether or not he actually succumbed to the plague or if it was just old age is not 100% known, but we do know that he left this work unfinished. Um, art historians think that this angel up here on the top was put in later. And you can see that the angel points his candle, that's a candle, at Jesus, but is looking down at Titian. And some art historians believe that that could be the angel of death here to carry them both away. And if you look down at the very bottom, there's an inscription that tells us who made these changes. Paul May, Titian's assistant. Uh, he did the finishing touches uh, before this work of art was dedicated to the church. Yeah. And you see how this painting suddenly becomes so interesting. And that's what I like about art theory. Um, it's not just about creating pretty pictures, things that are superficially attractive. There are so many times I hear from students that they didn't really like a work of art until they did a little bit of research, until they sort of dug a bit deeper, read the information, and then that work of art becomes interesting. And that's what this chapter is all about. And to finish up, who was this artist? What was she like? Well, Sonia Delaney Turk, she was fi uh, primarily a fashion designer, not uh, so much a fine art painter. Um, up there on the upper right is a portrait of her. Uh, these are some of her designs. Uh, there on the top are some swimsuits she designed. Uh, there on the bottom left is a costume she made for a production on Egypt. And then in the bottom right is my favorite. I wish that picture was in color because she designed that uh, driver's coat and then she painted a car to match, which I think is just totally rad. And uh, if you take a look at these uh, pictures and take a look at her painting and also at this painting here on the left that she made, you can definitely see a consistent uh, strain of bright colors and simple shapes. She was actually a very uh, flamboyant, interesting woman. Uh, sometimes whenever girls look at these swimsuit designs, they look very modest and sort of unflattering. Uh, but whenever you think that these are sort of late 1900, or uh, sort of 1910, 1918 designs, that's a lot of leg for uh, that period of time. So she's quite a dashing, daring young woman, uh, very much a flapper of the 1920s and 30s. Uh, another thing that artists usually dis or art historians discuss, discuss about Sonia Delaney Turk is um, how she was influenced by her husband and how her husband influenced her. Uh, there on the right is a picture by Robert Delaney, her husband, and as you can see, a uh, very cubist, very abstracted painting of the Eiffel Tower. So you can sort of see similarities between this husband and wife's work but also just unique stylistic choices on the part of Sonia. And then lastly, for Jean-Michel Basquiat, um, who was the artist? What was he like? Uh, whenever it comes to Basquiat, gosh, people are just pick apart his life. Uh, this was done in 1983, and he died in 1988. He was only um, 28 years old whenever he died. Uh, he did die of a drug overdose, and uh, the fact that he was uh, so heavily involved in drugs and graffiti and this sort of underground New York City art scene uh, was a very big part of how uh, artists analyze their work of art. So if you were to use the expressive theories to analyze horn players, you'd be focusing really on Basquiat and his drug use and his life and uh, the sort of people that he kept company with and just how that sort of crazy life manifested itself in these very uh, sort of brilliant, crazy paintings. Uh, his influence can also be felt, uh, if you keep an eye out, you'll see that three-pronged crown a lot on uh, like hip hop albums, t-shirts, and graffiti. Uh, that is an homage to Basquiat. Uh, the three-pronged crown is uh, one of the symbols that he used a lot in his paintings and also in his fine art. 
Yeah, and that's it for as far as the book is concerned. But something that I do in class is to have a little discussion about art in the art world. Here, let me uh, get out of here and go back to my pretty face. Hi. Um, one of your homework assignments is to read some articles about high paying works of art, works of art that sell for millions of dollars and how they're written about in articles and things. So I would like you to look at those articles, read them and write a response if you choose that homework assignment. As you know, for the homework, you can do any three topics you want. Uh, but if you're more interested in the discussion side rather than the artistic side, then uh, that might be an option for you to read about and consider. But that's it for chapter five. As I said, it's a pretty short chapter. I'm not even sure how long this video is. I don't see a counter, but uh, thanks for spending some time here. Um, I'll see you in class whenever class is back in session, hopefully soon. All right, bye.